الله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء محمد مصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم وبعض إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وصحبه وبارك وسلم وصل عليه In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful, choices, blessings, and salutations on His beloved Nabi Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Firstly, I would like to begin by congratulating the International Halal Conference uh, for this initiative, and inshallah, I pray that uh, all success comes to this uh, initiative and that in an education and knowledge is passed over for the benefit of the Muslim Ummah. Uh, the topic which I have been asked to discuss is the certification of beef and lamb abattoirs in South Africa. Indeed, this is quite an interesting topic because halal certification in South Africa dates back as far as the 1940s, where Halal certification was initiated by the butchers associations, most notably in the Western Cape or the Western Cape Muslim Butchers Association. Uh, we also consider that in 1956 there was the Wits Muslim Butchers Association, which operated in the Johannesburg uh, vicinity, and. They certified an abattoir in Newtown, and in 1971, they certified the City Deep Abattoir, which was the largest abattoir at that stage in the Southern Hemisphere. And they were indeed successful that they managed to have a, an abattoir that did not slaughter any pork, number one, and had a dedicated halal staff to do the uh, the slaughter at that particular abattoir with full Muslim supervision. And they were constituted formally, the Wits Muslim Butchers Association, in 1971. So when we talk about the National Independent Halal Trust, currently we certify 32 abattoirs across South Africa, and mostly in the beef and uh, lamb or the red meat uh, section. So the certification, I think it's important to discuss this first. Firstly, when an application is uh, received, we need to know which species is to be slaughtered at that particular abattoir, whether it is only beef or only lamb or are we talking about both species? And we need to know and we need to have that information in order to ascertain what the requirements for that particular uh, abattoir would be in terms of halal certification. Secondly, you need to also know the slaughter capacity of the facility. How many animals can be slaughtered and what is the capacity in terms of the storage for that particular uh, abattoir? There, after you know, you look at the staff requirements. You look at staff facilities, as far as uh, you know the requirements, as far as the number of sort of supervisors, halal supervisors, and you would also have to look at the number of uh, you know Muslim slaughtermen that you would need at that particular abattoir. Uh, at this stage, we need to make it also quite clear. But as the NIHT, we only allow uh, Muslim slaughtermen and Muslim supervisors at these abattoirs to oversee and to obviously slaughter at that particular abattoir. In terms of staff facilities, they need to have an office. They need to have uh, sufficient uh, equipment in terms of having a locker, uh, files uh, to have all that they need to undertake the successful supervision of a particular plant. And also we look at the potential clients that that particular abattoir 
wish to engage with and or wish to sell with at least. And it's important to know who those clients are and thereby you'd have to know what the requirements are from the client's perspective as well. Now, for any abattoir, you obviously, before certification, you need to have a, a preliminary audit that takes place. And this audit is not only done, you know, it's a halal expert with a technical, uh, a technical auditor. And sometimes you have technical experts, uh, you know, on site as well. Um, one of the the things that need to be done is that at these abattoirs, you need to look at the existing procedures that are in place. Uh, you look at the procedures in terms of receipt of the animals, whether they be beef and sheep, and you know to make sure that these animals, uh, you look at how far they are transported, the rest period after the animal comes to the abattoir, um, you know, ensure that uh, in their procedures there are uh, you know, facilities that uh, the animal needs in terms of water, etc. Also, when you're at this audit, you look at the storage facilities of the chillers and what those capacities are in terms of after slaughter, are they sufficient? Uh, the other thing that one would look at during a prenum audit is also the transport of vehicles. What vehicles would be used? by the, the company, would they be using uh, their own vehicles or would they be using outsourced vehicles? So all this information needs to be part of your premium audit and obviously looking at the slaughter for and you look at the rest of the facility as well. Post the premium audit, one would obviously need to provide recommendations. Obviously, firstly, supply the company with the audit report and recommendations for the certification of that particular uh, abattoir. Um, once that is in place and they have agreed to, to be certified and they are happy with the recommendations and confident of implementate, implementing halal standards, then obviously the staff that are placed at that particular abattoir or the staff that are supposed to be placed at the abattoir have to be trained. Um, if there was obviously non-halal slaughter at that abattoir, depending on the, the species, then one would have to undertake a con complete hustle or the complete sanitation of the abattoir and a sanitation also of the uh, vehicles in terms of Islamic law. Now, one of the most important uh, factors, uh, and this I spoke about, a bit earlier is that in terms of the slaughtermen, they have to be Muslim and they need to be practicing Muslims. They must have a good understanding and knowledge of Islam and they need to know that they are, on, they are performing a duty first to the Muslim Ummah and, you know, secondly to the job. And obviously, they must have sober habits and should not indulge in anything that would compromise themselves or the deen of Islam. And likewise, you know, as far as halal supervisors are concerned, the halal supervisor also needs to have the same expertise. And that halal supervisor needs to be, you know, a trustworthy and a strong person with a strong personality and capable of uh, supervising implementing the halal standards. Um, while we are on this particular slide, I think it is important that we talk about some of the duties that the supervisor uh, would undertake, and that is obviously to check on animals that come into the plant, uh, you know, make sure that they are sufficiently, um, that they are watered properly, and, you know, also check on animals to make sure that there are none that are injured or, you know, in a case where maybe emergency, emergency slaughter may need to take place. They also have to look at the slaughter floor, ensure that the stunning is done in a correct manner. And we will talk about stunning uh, on the next slide. And also to, you know, ensure that all halal standards are implemented. And the other factor which uh, the halal supervisor needs to undertake
undertake is to ensure that proper records are kept and sent to the head office of the halal certifying body uh, when the at the end of the week and ensure that the head office is uh, updated uh, you know on what takes place at the abattoir on a weekly basis <coughs> now the issue of stunning is a quite a contentious issue and we find that you know there are uh, halal standards implemented, most notably that of Malaysia, which allows the stunning of animals, and obviously it has to be a reversible stunning. And unfortunately, in a country like South Africa, it is mandatory that uh, you know that animals be be stunned for slaughter, and as such, we have to comply with uh, those particular laws and to ensure, obviously. That at all times, uh, you know, we do not compromise the ummah at the same time. So when it comes to the stunning of sheep, uh, sheep should be head stunned only. The time of application of electrical is 5 to 16 seconds, 200 volts, and 7 to 10 seconds at 180 volts. The electrodes must be placed so that they scan the brain, and apparatus that produces a constant current is preferred to that one to one that produces a, con a constant voltage. Uh, the apparatus must have a visible current sensor indicating, indicating current under, under load. And one of the important factors is that uh, the supervisor from time to time and even the slaughterman need to take one of the sheep after stunning off the line to, to ensure that you know it recovers and to ensure that they check on the stunner at, at all times. The Malaysian, uh, the MS-15009 um, standard stipulates that non-penetrative mushroom stunning is allowed in the case of beef. And this, uh, and you, it, it's a non-penetrative uh, stunning device. And there are certain uh, uh, aspects that one, we, we need to discuss as far as this is concerned, as far as the skull is actually concerned. So the center of the stunner shall be in contact with the animal at a point of intersection of lines drawn from the medial corners of the eyes and the base of the ears. The stunner shall be applied so that the head of the stunner is perpendicular to the frontal bone. The person doing the stunning should preferably be a Muslim and must be trained and assessed as competent in terms of proper stunning methods. And also the Muslim checker should ensure that the stunning play takes place uh, in that in a correct manner. And these are important uh, aspects that one needs to take note of as far as uh, the stunning of, of, of cattle are concerned. Uh, an important factor here is that after the stunning, uh, firstly, the, the animal should only be stunned once. After stunning, the animal should be slaughtered within 60 seconds. Post stunning, the, the, the Muslim checker must check the skull of the animal and should and the, and the animal skull should be examined to check for any cracks or any, uh, which would compromise the status of that particular animal. If a cracked skull is found due to the stunning, the serial number of that animal should be recorded and the animal's carcass and related products should be separated from the carcasses that are approved. Uh, so in other words, these uh, carcasses and all their products should be separated from the, uh, from the approved um, uh, stock or uh, carcasses and obviously kept uh, separated from them. Has died due to stunning shall be removed from the halal system. And the supervisor, the halal checker, <clears throat> and even if the slaughterer has any doubt, uh, they need to then check with the vet that is on site and ensure that uh, the decision is made and that animal uh, is taken out, out of the halal system. Um, the next factor that we talk about is the actual slaughter. So firstly, slaughter should not be visible to the other animals. Check on the condition and length and number of knives available to the slaughterers. 
this is important in terms of ensuring that the uh, knives are of a correct length and that they are sterilized uh, before the the, uh, the slaughter and subsequent slaughter is concerned. And obviously also that when the, the slaughterman and the supervisor should be able to identify life uh, signs of life in the animal after they are stunned uh, and ensure that uh, the slaughterers are able to do the same. Um, remove the, uh, we would remove animals such as lamb, uh, ostrich, chicken, rabbit off the line and check the recovery period to ensure that they are not dying of, of the stunning. Uh, slaughter should recite tasmiya with each slaughter and there should be visible lip movement. Um, also, unfortunately, you know, well, not unfortunately, but many of the slaughterhouses would insist on, on the slaughterman uh, wearing masks and the lip movement. Uh, is not possible, and you know, in terms of the noise uh, at the abattoir, sometimes not audible. But in terms of uh, the NIHT as an organization, uh, we instill and we train all our slaughtermen to ensure that the tasmia is is recited on all animals. Then comes the issue of of sticking, which is also. Uh, uh, you know, it's allowed by the by the Malaysian standard, and they have a a fatwa to that effect, and that has to be done by a Muslim, and after thirty seconds or thirty seconds after the slaughter has taken place. Now, another factor that we need to look at in terms of abattoirs is that of emergency slaughter. And what is emergency slaughter? This would apply to an animal that is in distress or injured when it comes into the uh, into the plant or into the abattoir or shortly thereafter. The animal has to be assessed by the chief meat, meat inspector and that chief meat inspector, he or she decides on the necessary action that needs to take place. Uh, the procedure dictates that this, the chief meat inspector informs the halal supervisor and the slaughter should be done by the Muslim slaughterer at the plant. Uh, that chief meat, meat inspector and the halal supervisor should be should record the emergency kill and the purpose of that animal should be tagged as non-conforming and should not be used for export or the local uh, halal market. And those particular, uh, you know, animals that uh, that are slaughtered uh, essentially um, would uh, would basically be removed from the halal system as well. Now, it's important to know what the bleeding times are at beef and lamb abattoirs. So, before any further processing of an animal takes place. Uh, a period of five minutes should elapse for lamb and ostrich, and for beef, eight minutes should pass before there's any further uh, processing of that particular animal. So in terms of, of, of these uh, times, this is according to the Meat Safety Act of South Africa, uh, Act Number 40 of 2075, bleeding times. So these are stipulated as per government regulations in the country and which the abattoirs have to follow, and obviously this ensures that there is death here, or the animal has died, and uh, there's no more life in that particular animal before it is skinned and any further uh, processing takes place. So at the abattoir, a beef or lamb abattoir, you will also find poorly bled animals. Uh, there are different ways of identifying an animal that has died before slaughter or that has had improper bleeding for some reason or the other. And this is visible in the cards. Uh, the following up, uh, you, know, you see a picture of, of a, an animal, animal that was slaughtered uh, and has died uh, basically maybe because of the slaughter or for whatever reason. And that would, uh, we have a picture of a sheep uh, carcass. That is what it lo looked like if it is not bled uh, properly. And obviously these animals are removed from uh, the halal uh, system as such and would not uh, be considered as halal and would not be 
processed in any way. So in terms of the slaughter and surprises, they're trained in terms of determination of life or death post stunning and, and the uh, the, the slaughtermen and uh, the supervisors would look at the following, and if there's any doubt, obviously the meat inspector is consulted and the necessary action uh, basically takes place. So fully dilated pupil, uh, pupils. Now the pupils of the eye are completely black, and that would mean that the animal has died before slaughter. Uh, absence of pupillary or corneal reflexes, if, them op if there's an open mouth, a flaccid tongue, that means the, the tongue is hanging loosely. The blood slaughter simply trickles but does not gush. And stable life is what needs to be in, a, in the animal at the time of slaughter. And in terms of it, stable life is recognized by the evidence seen by an onlooker. One of its signs is intense movement after the cutting of the air and windpipes, as well as the gushing of the blood. If an onlooker observes one of these two things happening, then the animal will be halal. So if there's slight movement you know, in an animal, it has been stunned, it, that particular animal would be uh, considered to be halal. Um, while we are talking about about slaughter, so as an organisation, the obviously the the, the the method of slaughter, the tasmia has to be safe. Uh, the windpipe and air pipe and one of the veins in the neck has to be completely cut. And you know, uh, obviously, like we said, and we 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 will say again that only Muslim uh, slaughtermen. Uh, are allowed to slaughter in abattoirs that are certified by the NIH. The other factors that uh, one needs to consider, and we talk specifically in terms of the South African market, and that is the the the, the role of marking of carcasses. So, in other words, that carcasses that are destined for the halal market in in South Africa would actually be rolled and, and have a halal mark on the carcass itself. And that goes along with the other marks as well as the tags and uh, serial numbers, etc. And there is traceability back to uh, the, that particular uh, batch and feedlot, etc. So that particular roller mark is under the jurisdiction of the uh, halal supervisor, and he is into. He has to be in total, total control of that, and at the same time, allow, not allowed to give it to any uh, non-Muslim within the plant. The halal supervisor also looks at the dispatch uh, of carcasses to to the halal market, and obviously, for that, vehicles have to be cleaned uh, before they enter the plant, and obviously. Uh, the halal supervisor needs to check on that and also, uh, you know, uh, ensure that there is nothing loaded on there and before that particular uh, vehicle is loaded with halal carcasses and obviously seal that particular carcass. The other aspect as far as dispatch is concerned that there are uh, transport certificates. So if it is going from, from the abattoir to a, uh, a halal wholesaler, um, then obviously there has to be a, a, a transport certificate and an intake letter which would accompany that particular load which is then signed off by the business that, 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 that receives it and uh, the halal supervisor at the other business would have to be in contact with the supervisor at the abattoir and be able to check on what has been dispatched and to ensure that what is being received by him is exactly the same. Also, then, as far as evidence are concerned, we need to look at, at, at returns, and there needs to be a returns uh, policy where you have carcasses or product that has come back to the abattoir for whatever reason. So firstly, when it comes back, there has to be a separate facility at the particular abattoir where that is stored, and uh, the supervisor, the Muslim supervisor, needs to check on 
on what has come in and at the same time he needs to make sure that that particular product is not uh, dispatched again as halal or does not go to a halal client at all. So these are the factors that uh, you know uh, one would look at uh, at abattoirs and therefore the issue of uh, the certification of a particular uh, abattoir firstly we have to ensure that it is complete halal slaughter and no non-halal slaughter at that particular abattoir at all. Secondly, that there is a, a the, the lines are dedicated to halal slaughter only, obviously, and that there be full Muslim uh, staff in terms of slaughter and supervision. And if the the abattoir uh, also, depending on the capacity and the size of the abattoir, uh, where there'd be a you know more than two supervisors needed at that particular abattoir, if there is deboning or any other such functions that take place at these abattoirs, and that there be constant uh, contact with that abattoir via the halal supervisor that works at the abattoir on a permanent basis, employed and paid by the organisation. Over and above that, as far as uh, abattoirs are concerned, uh, we ensure that abattoirs are audited a minimum of once a month uh, by our halal auditors. So that is over and above the halal supervisor who oversees the day-to-day -day functioning and implementation of the halal systems at that particular abattoir. Also, there is a halal team that is made up with management and obviously the slaughterman and the supervisor. And when there are issues that need to be discussed between the certifier and that particular uh, abattoir, these people form part of that halal team and that there be a, an understanding uh, between uh, the, the, the organization and that particular, halal, that particular halal team in terms of the certification of that abattoir. The other factor which, as the NIHT, we, we pay great importance to is continuous uh, improvement. And for that, there's continuous uh, seminars and training sessions for the slaughtermen and for the supervisors on a national level. And obviously, certain times where we would go into the slaughterhouses or the abattoirs and conduct individual training with specialized slaughtermen, with specialized uh, supervisors, in terms of uh, you know teaching and educating them on uh, factors which affect the work that they do in terms of ensuring halal is maintained and upheld at all times. Uh, Alhamdulillah, this is just a an, an overview of uh, halal certification of, as far as beef and lamb abattoirs in South Africa are concerned. And I thank you for your attention. Inshallah. And at another occasion, maybe we can go into further depth as far as this topic is concerned. Jazakallah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum.